Good evening everyone and welcome to the History Council of New South Wales Awards for 2020. I'm Dr Stephen Gapps, President of the History Council of New South Wales and I'll be your host for tonight's ceremony. But before we start, I wish to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waters where we gather tonight. Lands and waterways that sustain people for millennia that were taken from them without their consent and without treaty. It's important to acknowledge here that what we now call New South Wales has always been a place of history for many Aboriginal nations. And as writers, readers and lovers of history, we can draw strength and guidance from Aboriginal Torres Strait Island knowledge, memory and ongoing histories. Since its inception, the History Council of New South Wales has run a suite of awards and prizes aimed at recognising excellence in historical practice. Growing in breadth over the past 25 years, we now judge and present four annual awards, as well as the prestigious Annual History Citation, which recognises a lifelong contribution to the practice of history. We are very grateful, grateful for the support we receive from our volunteer judges and sponsors, a number of whom are here with us tonight to present the prizes. In this COVID year, it's going to be an unusual night for you, for us and the winners, and just a few of us are here in the studio tonight, with the majority of award winners attending from their homes across the state. So please sit back and enjoy as we reveal some wonderful emerging historians, acknowledge some outstanding historians who have inspired us for many years, and hear about some intriguing new aspects of the history of New South Wales. In a new format this year, we will have time not only to meet and celebrate the winners, but to get to hear a bit about their winning entries and what it took to make these histories. So our first award tonight is the Max Kelly Award, which is given to a beginning historian for a work of excellence in any aspect of Australian history. The award was established as a tribute to Associate Professor Maxwell John Kelly, the first elected president of the History Council of New South Wales. The History Council of New South Wales is grateful to Geoffrey Jones for his continuing support and generous donation of the $500 prize money for this the 2020 Max Kelly Prize. Mr Jones couldn't be here tonight and he asked us to present the award on his behalf. And this year the award goes to Elizabeth Heffernan for her essay, O for Places, Green Oases, Australian Soldiers and the Environments of the First World War. So Elizabeth, congratulations on winning the Max Kelly Award. So um, could you tell us a little bit about the essay? To me, soldiers and environmental history don't seem at first glance to be something that fit together easily. So can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Uh, yeah, I guess they don't at first glance seem to have much in common, um, but they do more than you might think. So the soldier diaries I read for this essay uh, they're full of descriptions of the environments of the war and environment was a really big part of soldier experience on the front that I guess not a lot of historians have focused on but it is there in the diaries and I really wanted to bring that out in this essay. Yeah, that's, so what were some of the original discoveries that you made along the way? Um, I mean, I guess the main one was just how significant an aspect of the war the environment was and not just to the experiences of combat itself, but to individual soldiers and how they sort of dealt with circumstances of the war, uh, how they um, reacted to combat differently in different environments, and um, yeah, just how understanding the role of nature in the war really changed their understandings of the war itself. Um, yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. and I was it difficult? Did, did you find anything difficult to, to find, to extract that kind of view of the environment from, from soldiers in, in, in conflict? Uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a bit difficult. I did have to delve through quite a few diaries and really read um, a lot really closely to sort of get the different um, perspectives on this. Um, but yeah, no, there, there's, the information was there. It was just... Uh, really trying to find it and then draw out the sort of argument that I wanted to make um, mm. in regards to the environment, yeah. So it's about the way that you read those diaries in a different, with a di different lens, I guess. Did, yeah. did, 
Did the did your uh, was there guidance from your supervisor or mentor? Uh, yeah, 100%. Um, uh, this essay was part of my thesis from last year at Sydney Uni and my supervisor was incredibly important to it. She guided me, um, made sure that I focused on one aspect and not just went all over the place with my research. So yeah, it was um, really important to have that guidance there in writing this. So just, just quickly, one, one, more, one more question. Um, do, you, do you think that you might pursue a career in in history? Um, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Uh, that's, that's the dream, that's the goal at the moment. Um, so maybe further study beforehand, but definitely that's a long-term goal. All right, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and, and my congratulations again. Thank you. Now, I'd just also like to congratulate Robbie Wardho for receiving an honourable mention for the entry titled, Not Just a Phase, A Queer History of Newcastle. So, our next award is the Aboriginal History Award. Earlier this year, the History Council decided that more emphasis needs to be placed on Indigenous history in the Council's activities and operations. Now, this award has for several years now been a wonderful inspiration to further commitment in this important area of New South Wales and national history. With us in the studio tonight to present this award is our most excellent Vice President, Associate Professor Nancy Cushing. Thank you, Stephen, and also to the anonymous donor who provides a $1,500 prize. The Aboriginal History Award was initiated in 2016. Its purpose is to encourage students and other beginning historians up to the postdoctoral stage of their careers in the writing of Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history from original sources. Indigenous Australians are strongly encouraged to enter. The winning entry needs to demonstrate excellence in addressing its subject, proficiency in the use of original materials, and clarity of exposition. The winner of the 2020 Aboriginal History Prize is Miss Sally Bukaram Gattis for her essay, Black Power, Aboriginal Genocide, and the Politics of Identity. Sally, warm congratulations on winning the Aboriginal History Award. Thank you. I've got some questions for you, if you don't mind, just to hear a little bit more about the background to this paper and your process in writing it. So your paper examines the 1970 petition to the UN by five Indigenous Australians, which charged the Australian government with genocide. So why did you choose to focus in on their use of that term and the concept of genocide? Well, my focus on genocide was initially driven by my interest in the relationship between words and meaning based on the context in which they use or perform politically. Um, so genocide is a highly politicized and contentious term, and I'm interested in the way it functions in different spaces, like the scholarly, the legal, and the affective. Mm. Um, but it seemed that much academic discourse focused on applying genocide as a lens through which to read indigenous history, weighing up historical events against a working definition. For me, this left much unanswered. I wanted to understand how Indigenous agents conceived of their own experience, not just how scholars have interpreted their history. With genocide so deeply entangled in political discourse, tracing the use of the word genocide also allowed me to challenge the place of subjectivity in academic discourse. Great, thank you. Um, and, and I noticed that you conducted a lot of primary research for this paper, um, as is one of the requirements of the prize. And you conducted research in the Office of Aboriginal Affairs, uh, the National Archives of Australia. And the one that really intrigued me was in ASIO. So how did this material shape your thinking about the topic? Yeah, the archival research I conducted was hugely significant in shaping my research. Um, so approaching this kind of intellectual history required me to broaden my source base into the non-European and also the non-canonical types of text because the actors I, I was studying sat outside the institutions who actually created, produced and controlled such knowledge. So ASIO's files, for example, um, embody this creation of state produced and state controlled knowledge about Aboriginal peoples. And so what was really interesting about it is that they provided me with just as much of an insight into the organizations as the subjects themselves, revealing the anxieties of state and surveillance authorities um, around Indigenous activism. Mm. So 
In the process um, of surveillance, the archives unintentionally provided me with preserved material written by Aboriginal people themselves, which would have been otherwise lost. Um, on the other hand, the ASIO's archive provided me with some ethical dilemmas because I was aware that I was accessing information produced without the consent of the subjects. So it was an important shift for me as I was forced to interrogate my own position and optic lens as a non-Indigenous researcher and think about how knowledge about Indigenous communities has been produced, especially as a Lebanese Australian and a beneficiary of settler colonialism through migration. Mm, yeah, really interesting. Um, and so what do you think is your most important finding or, or the message that you would want people to take away from this piece of writing? Um, I think that the most important message that arises from my paper is through the Indigenous voices in the sources. So the writers of the petition and the activists and thinkers who were drawn into the web of my analysis presented a sustained conception of Australia's settler colonial history. And I chose to focus on it because it struck me personally as a very profound articulation of Aboriginal consciousness, suffering, genocide and settler colonialism. Um, methodologically, I can only hope that I've conveyed the fruits of applying traditional methods of intellectual history while interrogating the established paradigms around sources and subjects. Mm. Yeah, I think you have done a tremendous job in doing that. And so where to now? What, what's your next project or what, what are you up to now in terms of your historical activity? I'm still exploring the connections between genocide and Aboriginal th thinking um, and trying to interrogate my own position as a researcher. Um, and I'm thinking about some cursory issues raised in my paper, such as surveillance in Aboriginal history and ASIO's archives, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and I hope to pursue that in a PhD in the next few years. Oh, fantastic. Well, we'll all look forward to reading the, the outcome of that PhD. Once Thank again, you. congratulations. Uh, really excellent work. Thank you. I'd also like to congratulate Mrs. Kate Hayton for receiving an honourable mention for her essay entitled Indigenous Servicemen of Walhalla. Lest we forget, will we remember them? And I'd just like to mention that Kate was one of our highly valued History Council interns in 2019. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Sally. Now, one of the History Council's object objectives is to recognise the diversity of historical perspectives. And our next presentation brings that vision to life through the Addison Road Community Organisation Award for Multicultural History. The winner receives a citation and a prize of $500. And with me in the studio tonight to present this award, I have Mina Bowie-Jones, Programs Coordinator at the Addison Road Community Centre. Thank you, Stephen. I'm really happy to be here this evening to present this award. The purpose of the award is to encourage new and emerging historians to discover, analyse and explore multicultural histories and the history of multiculturalism in Australia in order to help increase academic and public engagement in a topic that has ongoing relevance to Australian history and society today. The winning entry, which can be an essay or multimedia, needs to make an original argument using primary historical sources and demonstrate the capacity to develop complex arguments linking the past to contemporary multicultural issues that have had or are currently impacting on the Australian community. It is my great pleasure to present the 2020 Addison Road Community Organisation Award for Multicultural History to Dr Alexandra Delios for her essay Unsettling Post-War Settlement, Remembering Unassimilable Families in the Space of the Migrant Camp. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alexandra, congratulations on winning the Addison Road Community Organisation Award for Multicultural History. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you and um, I'd like to let you know that your essay is exactly the sort of essay we dreamed of um, being submitted and winning this award when we first um, developed the idea with the History Council for presenting it. Um, could you tell me a little bit about why you were motivated to write it? Uh, yep, sure thing. Well, well, first of all, the piece is about post-war migrant camps as unsettling spaces for newly arrived families in post-war Australia. And it came off the back of some ethnographic and oral history work I did with members of the Benalla Migrant Camp group. Um, so a community of former child migrants 
residents of a series of migrant camps, uh, most notably Benalla Migrant Camp, um, who'd passed through these camps as, as children and teenagers throughout the 50s and the 60s, and were now dispersed across um, Australia. They had petitioned the Heritage Council to list the remnants of that camp on the State Heritage Register, um, which was initially rejected. Um, they then petitioned to have um, that decision revised, and that was when they'd got, gotten in contact with me, um, wondering if I wanted to do any oral histories with them. Um, and I then wanted to kind of explore migrant home building with them, uh, this idea of family and generational memory. And it really brought me around to the argument that this place of the migrant centre has come to feature quite prominently in uh, the meaning making practices of this cohort of child migrants that are still grappling with um, unsettled and unsettling family histories. And I think these types of stories rarely get a hearing in more celebratory renditions of the post-war immigration scheme. And that has always kind of been my motivation for doing this type of research. Mm. And um, may I ask what, um, what's grown out of the project for you, where you might take, um, take the experience next? Um, yeah, I've continued to kind of engage with this group of uh, post-war child migrants um, and kind of their journey towards getting a, a, not just a specific place recognised and listed, but uh, really, I suppose, publicising their stories more um, and kind of building on that oral history record as it exists across our cultural collecting institutions in Australia, which don't feature very much the voices of, I suppose, non-English speaking background migrants. Um, and I really believe oral history can help us um, illuminate the long term and kind of processual, processual nature of settlement in forming, forming family histories in this country. Um, it was also part of kind of challenging conventional histories of multiculturalism. I think you also highlighted the importance of place and in the role of family history and um, uh, the formation of identity in, in um, migrant culture in Australia. So um, as a place-based organisation, Addison Road Community Organisation, um, we also found that very relevant and um, I think there's a lot more work to be done in exploring that. Yeah, I definitely agree. We can gain a lot more from kind of centering um, I suppose minority perspectives which provides a, a different meaning um, to our uh, more collective notions of, of what it means to be um, a migrant today and over time. Congratulations. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much to the Addison Community um, Organisation as well. Thank you very much, Mina. And once again, congratulations, Alexandra. Our awards for excellence in history have evolved over the years to reflect the growth of many different forms of history. And they will no doubt continue to evolve as the ways we understand our past are ever changing. The two important areas in this are professional history, those historians who go, off, go about the often unnoticed but incredibly influential daily grind of researching and writing history for all sorts of publications, for heritage reports, and a huge range of history in the public sphere. The other is the training and study of how people interact with history and how they apply it in their daily lives. I'm sure you will agree a most valuable element in the practice of history. So this year, Macquarie University Centre for Applied History and the Professional Historians Association, New South Wales and ACT, have joined together to sponsor a new award called the Macquarie PHA Applied History Award. And with me in the studio tonight, I have Associate Professor Tanya Evans from Macquarie University and Dr. Peter Hobbins from the PHA, Professional Historians Association. Thank you, Stephen. It's a huge honour to be here tonight to present this prize, which has attracted a great deal of interest and a terrific range of applications. As I've said for many years, this is often the most exciting uh, day of the year for historians uh, in New South Wales. The purpose of the award is to encourage historians to produce a creative work of applied history drawing on their research. 
It aims to promote the value of public history and the pursuit of history as a rewarding professional career, but also as a rewarding side hustle as well. Uh, the award is open to historians at all stages of their career, including those inside and outside of academic institutions, including undergraduate, diploma, masters and doctoral level students, as well as professional, local, community and family historians. Individuals and groups are eligible to apply. The winning entry needs to demonstrate excellence in writing or other media and the ability to use original source materials or demonstrated originality in interpreting the past in a contextual way. This work should engage with the field and practice of professional, public and applied history, using the past to inform contemporary concerns, issues and topics in creative ways. And we also want to encourage uh, collaboration in the community and it's been fantastic this year being able to collaborate with the PHA in this award. Um, and both of us really, really loved the winning entry for 2020, uh, which has come with a prize of $1,000 and is a documentary entitled Women of Steel, directed by Robin Murphy and produced by Martha and Sara. Congratulations, Robin and Martha. A lot of these jobs in BHP surely would be very difficult grimy, noisy, dirty jobs. I mean, do women in Port Kemba or Wollongong want these jobs? Tents, banners and petitions presented an unfamiliar sight to steel workers at Australian Iron and Steel today. The group is planning to file the first class action suit Australia has ever seen against the steelworks company. It's a crazy, you're not going to beat BHP. Are you one of those women in the tents? Well, one I nearly threw off the bridge because he was being very cheeky. When I looked the paper, job for women. Women especially, they are good fighters. Thanks. We're over the moon about this award. We're quite humbled to have even been considered. So thank you so much. Um, I think Martha has something to say about her role as producer. Yes, I came into the project um, somewhat late. I mean, it was years, but it was somewhat late because Robin was the, is the producer of the film and I called myself consulting producer to try to get out of the work. Well, congratulations to you both. You've done a magnificent job. Uh, well, we have a couple of questions for you if you're happy to answer them for us about making of the documentary. Yes, sure. Look, this is obviously a project of passion, but also one of empathy as well. I mean, we really get to feel the lives, the long-term struggle that the women in your documentary endured. Um, where did you actually get your inspiration to even begin this marathon project? I actually lived all of this, Tony. I, I lived the whole campaign. I worked at the Steelworks, but I also lived the camaraderie and the closeness of all of the women that were involved. Um, so it was always pretty much a no-brainer that I had to make a film about her. Um, but it wasn't until, I think, you know, after, I really couldn't do it while I was working in the steelworks. I worked there 30 years. But I think when I kept on being contacted by history students who wanted to do PhDs and theses on our campaign, I realised it is a lot more significant than just living through it. and you know, we have a responsibility to tell this story and to put it in, a, in its rightful place in society. One of the other things I really noticed in the film was the importance of local collections, local connections and even regional archives. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of fostering those connections in telling a story like the one you had? With all of the archival material, and Martha will talk a little bit about this because part of this was her baby, um, we had, because the campaign really depended on community support and that connection and relationship with community, including local newspapers, local um, television stations, and of course organisations, when I got to actually making the film, I reconnected with a lot of those with those relationships that we'd had years before. So it was, and, and in fact, our, we have, you know, the local papers and local TV station are our major sponsors. 
um, in terms of giving us material that otherwise would have cost us a fortune. We would not have been able to make the film without their generous support. But Martha um, did a lot of work um, finding photographs that had actually never been published and, and that really helped make the film too. And of course, Robin had been saving things through all this time and collecting evidence. It, it, amazing. So she just trot out all sorts of stuff from her boxes, which, um, yes, really was remarkable. But with a, with a film, it's so different from writing history, which I have done. And you need to bring it alive and words will not do it. You know, so we, we had to find within a budget that was created by purely by donations, we had to find a means to um, bring this film alive. And I love snooping around. That's why you make documentaries, so you can snoop around. And the chance to snoop around and find the photographs that the Mercury no longer had, that's our local paper in Wollongong, um, <clears throat> they no longer had them, but I found them and, you know, deciphered the code of the non-catalogue and, you know, many other things and just kept at it because it's really fun. Mm. So, but, but absolutely essential, absolutely essential in telling a story like this. And yeah. also, also because um, the period was 40 years ago, we found a lot of our archival material was on, for example, 16 millimeter film, and it was sitting in the archives of the Wollongong University Library, who fortunately had held onto it. And again, it was a real challenge to, to find some of the material because it wasn't catalogued in the uni unique way that most historians would like to find material. So that was quite challenging too. But we spent a lot of time, you know, crawling through footage. And what was good though, was that a lot of the footage was of that period, helped us to also put ourselves and put the story in the right context. So yeah, absolutely essential to use archival material. And you gave it back to the community too, which I think was fantastic. So congratulations again for actually sharing your work back with the people who kept all these sources. Thank you. And it was clearly a, a labour of love many years in the making. What did it mean to you both to win this award? I think well, I'm still trying to pick up my jaw. <laughs> um, to me, it does mean that this particular campaign that came at a period in society where there were changes as a result of this campaign, it has meant that, you know, it is recognised as part of history. And, and so we can't thank you enough for that, but it, it gives us that unique sort of tip that yes, we are part of history. And the great thing is that um, it will help us in getting the film around into, for instance, education, where, where an award like this really counts, as Robin says, because you know, you spend years making a film, but it isn't, it doesn't exist until it's seen and it doesn't exist until it makes an impact. And we also have a very strong, we, we actually discussed and analyzed what this was all about, why it succeeded, what it might give the future. And so all of that work will be carried forward in part because of this prize. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful news. And we hope you inspire lots of other um, historians in the community to do the same sorts of things. Do you, what, what do you have next on your plan of activities? Oh, you must be joking. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, nobody makes a film unless they're sort of obsessed and, and, and they say they'll never do it again once they finish. It's sort of like having a baby or, or having a, a, a torrid romance. Are you selling it? Clearly. <laughs> and, and I mean, the other thing is a film also is like a house. You know, you make the film, you build a house, but the house is never finished and neither is the film. And um, I think, you know, the next period for us is getting the film out there 
and also creating conversations with people about how people can come together and make changes in society and particularly now, particularly for women, um, we have seen that this is a masculinised budget that we're looking at. Society generally, there's not much that has been changed. Some things have remained the same and some things have got worse. So taking this film and being part of discussions today is really important for us as well. Oh, well, congratulations to you both. It was lovely to, to chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. And really an amazing achievement and well done for putting it back out into the world. Thank you very much Tanya and Peter and congratulations Robin, Martha and the entire production team of Women of Steel. Congratulations are also in order for two entries that have received honourable mentions from the awards committee, Kara Voices by Masako Fukui and the story of a young Fijian Indian girl, an Aboriginal Australian activist and White Australia by Lucy Yinyin Lu. Now we come to the annual history citation. And with me in the studio tonight, I have one of our History Council Executive Committee members, Dr. Kira Lindsay, who's going to present this prestigious award. Thanks, Stephen. The annual history citation presentation commenced in 1997, and since that time, it's been awarded every year to an eminent historian in New South Wales to honour their lifetime of service to history. The citation recognises individuals for their outstanding research and scholarship and acknowledges their broader contribution also through teaching, leadership, mentoring and community involvement. And so, without further ado, I'm very honoured to present the annual history citation for 2020 to Professor Paul Ashton. Hi Paul, Hi, congratulations. Kira. Thank you very much. And there you are, there's oh, your award. Great, thank now, you very much. Now, I've got a, a wonderful citation to read, which is all about you, and I think people need to know about it, so I'd like to read it out. Please do. All right. The annual history citation awarded by the History Council of New South Wales recognises and honours an individual who has made a significant and a lifeline contribution to the contribution and practice of history. For 2020, the History Council of New South Wales is very pleased to award this citation to you in recognition of your outstanding contribution to the study of Australian history and the international practice of public history. Paul, you graduated from Macquarie University in 1982 with a honours and then a PhD in 1999. You became an independent public historian with your own business for over 10 years before you were appointed to the public history program at the University of Technology in Sydney. From that base, you became the editor of the first public history journal in Australia, which is the Public History Review, and it's still running. In 1999, you also co-founded co and subsequently co-directed the Australian Centre for Public History at UTS, the University of Technology, Sydney, which is an essential companion to the Masters in Public History and the many successful research student degree students who followed on. Paul, you have been incredibly generous with your time and constantly assisting younger scholars, such as myself and many others, and professional historians through formal and informal means. You've been a judge of the New South Wales Premier History Awards five times, and you've had over 30 doctoral student completions while at UTS, and you're still supervising doctoral candidates. And you've also contributed to the infrastructure of history in New South Wales. You've been, the, you've been involved with the Sydney History Group, with the Professional Historians Association. You were one of the founding members of this History Council of New South Wales. And you've also been very involved in the Dictionary of Sydney. You um, are still involved with UTS and the University of Canberra and Macquarie University. And on top of all of those incredible things, you've also somehow found time to author, co-author and edit 25 books and textbooks, including 
more recently, 28 short creative non-history books for children. I mean, it's extraordinary. You've just sort of covered the whole range of things. So what is it that you most love about history? I really uh, am passionate about public history. It really is my big thing. I've made it my purpose in professional life to get public history out there and work with students who are also um, out in the community um, and in cultural institutions to push the word and to democratise the practice of history. Yeah, so it's all about history for the public, by the public. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And what is it that you think that historians really need to be able to do their job and do it well? I think they need to be democratic and egalitarian, um, but they need to be very good communicators um, and to engage really carefully with communities. Mm. And so, given that you've got such a breadth and depth of an understanding of history from an academic point of view, from um, a public point of view, working and a committee point of view, and you've sort of seen it change so much. What would you say are some of the key changes that have happened over the last 10 or so years? And sniffing the wind of the future, where do you think we're going next? I think historical practice has, well, democratised a huge amount uh, in the last decade or two. Um, but it's also become more creative. Mm. I think a lot of historians have let their hair down. Um, and have become more imaginative in the way in which they present history. The children's, uh, the non-fiction uh, history children's books uh, that I've been doing have been absolutely liberating. Yeah. And it's given me an opportunity to reach an audience that I haven't reached before. And, uh, and I only see good things in the future. I think the professional historians are going to grow and prosper. So I hear you saying that the future of history can be creative and fun as well as for and with the public. Absolutely, absolutely. If it's not fun, we don't want to do it. And that's why I think you've been awarded the citation this year because you've helped make it that way for so many of us. So on behalf of the History Council of New South Wales and all people who love history in New South Wales, I'd like to congratulate you very much for this extremely well-earned well award. Thank, Thank you, you so Paul. much, Kira. That's Thank lovely. You. Thank you very much, Kira, and congratulations, Professor Paul Ashton, for your well-deserved award of the annual history citation. Paul has been an inspiration to many historians over the years, including myself. And I thank Paul for being one of the amazing array of historians who taught applied history at the University of Technology, Sydney in the 1990s. There are many people working in all sorts of areas of history today that I am sure will be very pleased about you receiving this honour from the History Council. So that's all we have for you in this year's History Council of New South Wales Awards. Well, 25 years of awards has been, I think, an outstanding effort. I'd like to note that the councillors are looking at how we might take these awards even further in future. So look out for what we hope will be an expanded version of this event next year. And anyone wishing to assist in the sponsorship of history in this state at a time when history and historical understanding is so critical to our lives, please do get in touch with the council. If you're keen to know more about some of the award-winning entries, links will be up on our website shortly. I'd like to thank our prize sponsors as well as Create New South Wales who provide essential support for the History Council. And also a special thanks to the City of Sydney who have provided us with a cultural resilience grant this year to enable us to record and produce this ceremony online. And of course, a very big thank you goes to our hardworking events subcommittee and our wonderful staff, Catherine Shirley and Cassandra Rogers, without whom this History Council Awards Night would not be possible. Thank you all and I look forward to seeing everyone perhaps in person next year at some of the amazing array of history events we are planning for 2021. Good night.